And now from London, England, here's your host, Richard Thomas. Hello, and welcome to a special edition of It's a Miracle. I'm here in front of one of London's most famous landmarks, the Houses of Parliament. Tsar Nicholas of Russia called this remarkable edifice a dream in stone. And for nearly a thousand years, it was the seat of government for a vast empire that spanned the globe. So it seems fitting place to begin a story that takes us from Great Britain on an amazing journey halfway around the world, a journey that ends in a miracle. In 1992, John Beatty gave up his teaching position in Middlesbrough, England, to pursue his dream, sailing around the world on his 35-foot sloop, the Warrior Queen. The boat was a fine, seaworthy boat, but she didn't have things like sonar or radar or a long-distance radio. This was a plain, simple sailing boat. Despite its name, the Warrior Queen was no match for the unpredictable power of the Atlantic Ocean. I had very bad weather most of the time. If you're in a really bad sea in a small boat, she lurches from side to side, she pitches up and down, she gets flooded by waves, you're permanently soaked, and if the water's cold, you're frozen right to the bone. John quickly learned a basic lesson of survival. A tired sailor must trust the winds to guide his boat while he sleeps below. And the hard thing to do is to settle into that and realize you can sleep and leave the boat to plow through the night on its own. By the time he reached Venezuela, John's dream of circumnavigating the globe had changed. I made the decision that I would settle for a one-year circuit of the Atlantic Ocean, which would take me from Ireland down to South America and back up through the Caribbean and home. Well, once I decided that uh, I was going to settle for a one-year trip, I decided to pick up some other crew. So I came across a, a, a Kiwi, a New Zealander, called Hamish Scott. He joined me on my boat. It turned out to be a first-rate crew member. But uh, I still had problems with the boat. Bad water pumps too bad, John. Yeah. We had a water cooling pump for the engine that had stopped working. We couldn't fix it. So we spent days trying to find a replacement and eventually made do without. They set sail from Caracas to Antigua, a distance of 600 miles. But from the very start, the winds were against them. The course was roughly northeast. But because the wind was coming more or less from the northeast, we had to kind of tack all the time, and uh, it was slow progress. For three days, the sailors worked constantly with little or no sleep to keep roughly on course. OK, ready, boy? Lee Ho! Hey. On the third night, John recalled the lesson he'd learned on the Atlantic and decided it was time both men got some well-deserved rest. Well, that's it. Nothing to worry about. We'll see you in the morning, OK? Oh, yeah. Kill the lights before you go to sleep. Yeah, hit the window. And I knew that as long as you were well away from hazards and well away from shipping lanes and hundreds of miles from land, that it was fairly safe to sleep and let the boat sail herself through the night. As they slept, the warrior queen took her own course. And at dawn, Hamish was the first to wake. I woke thinking I'd heard a, a man crying for help. And I lifted my head and put it back down again. I thought, no, no, it couldn't have been a man. Well, it must, must be a seabird or something like that, because you know, there's no chance anyone could be out here. And, and then I heard it again. So I got up, climbed up the companionway and looked out and here was this guy waving his arms, yelling out in an open, open boat. Hey, John! As soon as I heard the knocking, I jumped out of the, the, the little cabin, looked out over the side of the boat, and there in a little open boat was a man standing up and trying to attract our attention. Now, for the first time ever in my life, I literally could not believe my own eyes. 
Was the man in the boat real or an hallucination? Was this an ambush or a desperate warning? An angel or a ghost? The amazing answer when it's a miracle returns. After three days of fighting winds that were pushing them off course, John Beatty and Hamish Scott decided to let their boat sail where it may while they got a good night's sleep. During the night, the winds guided the warrior queen to the only other boat within hundreds of miles. On it, a man as thin as a ghost, but it wasn't a ghost they were seeing. It was a living miracle, and his name was Martin Simon. Nine days earlier, Martin and his friend Rodney were returning to Grenada from an offshore island when their boat ran out of gas. And finally, when the engine cord broke, they knew they you were in that? serious trouble. Boy, you see now, now you're breaking the thing. No, we stuck yeah. out here. That way, you see, I didn't want to pull it so hard enough to get. The current began pulling them farther and farther away from shore. We dropped an anchor, but we didn't have enough rope. So the boat kept drifting. But well, we left the anchor in the water safe in case he made a shallow part, they're gonna stick. But that didn't happen. By the next day, the two men were reported missing and a massive search began. But the only plane that flew near them failed to see them below. Rodney we had a yellow coat and he keep waving, waving the yellow coat. And I said, Rodney, well, it make no sense you're waving no more because they can't see us. So just sit down and relax yourself. You know, you just got to prepare for what come. But nothing could prepare them for day after day in the boiling sun and a terrible thirst that couldn't be quenched. There's no way we could get water and food there, so I take my mind off of that. But we already didn't have his mind off. We had a 16-ounce bottle, and he would fill that 16-ounce bottle of water and drink salt water every day. Every day. And I used to say, Roddy, that's bad for you. Stop drinking that salt water. It's good water, man. Ain't nothing wrong with the water. But Rodney wouldn't listen and continued to drink from the ocean. His movements and his, his speech started to go. You see that? On the sixth day, he died just like that. For the next two days, Martin kept his friend's dead body with him in the boat. But near the end, he was forced to bury him at sea, floating the body in hopes that someone might find it. I did that and watched the body just sail away. And from that, then horror take me. Because the whole night, I just can't sleep. The next 24 hours were a mixture of nightmare and reality. At one point, voices told Martin to jump overboard, but at the last moment, he resisted. Sit in the house, come back in the boat, and started to pray again to ask God for help. Then the morning when I get up, in the horizon, I could see something like an angel, a white thing just appear to me. It was a boat. But to me, it was like an angel coming up. That boat was guided straight to me. As I said, my prayer was answered. Martin began calling out for help, but no one responded. And as the boat drew nearer, it was his turn to imagine that it was nothing but a ghost ship. And when I looked, there's nobody in the boat. I said, God, well, what's going to take place now? That's my only hope. Just then, a man appeared on deck and just as quickly disappeared below. So I said, Lord, you know this guy go? He just passed me. You know he's going to leave me and go in truth? But John and Hamish had no intention of leaving. By now, we had passed this boat. I started the engine. I swung the bow around and started to motor back towards him. Unfortunately, the engine was working fine at this stage. We had sailed to within feet of each other in an area, literally, bigger than the size of Texas. So I suppose if you wanted to make a comparison, it would be like there's one person living in Texas, and you set out to walk across Texas, and you happen to come across each other in the middle of Texas while one is sleeping.
And at that time, I just didn't know what to say. But I just thought, we got to get this guy. And we got to try and take care of him. Eventually, I got him close enough and under control, and I told him to jump. I don't know where he got the strength to do this from, but he managed to summon up the strength to lean forward and leap towards my boat. And I fell back, and as I fell back, he came over the rail, and that was it. We had him on board. Give me some water, hey, Mish. I knew that this was a man who was very much on the edge of life. Be okay. I was conscious there and then that had we not came across him, that he would have died that day for certain. I mean, his heart and his spirit and his body would have broken. Three days later, the warrior queen entered a harbor in Antigua. Martin Simon was taken to the hospital where he remained for six weeks until he was completely recovered. During that time, another miracle occurred in his life. He met his wife-to-be, Karen. I met her in the hospital. Uh, we became friends and we got married. Now I got two kids and my wife. She is a therapist and I continue doing my diving as usual. And now she's pregnant and another baby, it's our baby. <laughs> it's been seven years since Martin has seen the men who saved his life, and it's a miracle arranged to bring them back together. Good to oh, see you. So good to good see you, you're looking well. Oh, you look good. You're not as skinny as what you were last time. Together again, all three men pondered the miraculous circumstances that joined their lives. How did that yacht come that direction? And I said, because God made it happen that way. Because I pray a lot about that. I'm a pray answered. He couldn't come, but he sent an angel to guide me at the time. And the angel was a warrior queen, captained by John Beatty and Hemish Scott. I'm a mathematics professor, and my specialty is probability theory. And I figured that the chances of these two little boats coming across each other hundreds of miles from land in the open Caribbean were literally less than a chance of winning the national lottery. But you win the lottery and you become a millionaire, but this man won his particular personal lottery and he had literally a second life. And I think that's a bigger prize. I'd call this whole situation a miracle. There's just so many things that had to come together. All the elements of the current, the sea, the the fact that we came close enough for him to yell out to wake me up. It's just unbelievable. You could call it coincidence, but uh, there's something bigger than that. It's a miracle.